The call of Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I think that was the cutest yeah. scripture reading in the history of scripture reading. <laughs> I'm going to set that there. It's great to be here in uh, Loma Linda. I've had the privilege of being here on a number of occasions, but I've never had the privilege and the honor of preaching in the university church. In fact, last night was the first time I've ever been in the church. Beautiful facility. But I will say, and I'm not just uh, flattering uh, you or your congregation. The only thing more beautiful than the facility is the people that I have met so far. And to a person, they have been absolutely wonderful. So uh, great to be here. It's an honor to be a part of your service this morning. For the first time in my preaching life, I've been preaching now for about 25 years, I will be, I just learned, I will be giving the same sermon, <laughs> not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. Uh, so this is going to be an adventure. I'm looking forward to it. Um, unfortunately for you, you're probably going to get the worst one. <laughs> because I'll be a little warmed up for the second one. The third, if I had to guess, I think will be the, the top. And then the fourth will be a bit of a letdown. I'll be tired by then. <laughs> um, we are in the midst, uh, we're actually beginning a series called, what's it called, everyone? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Excellent. And Ty got us off to an amazing start last night. This is a 12-part series. Uh, myself, uh, Ty Gibson, and Jeffrey Rosario. And then also we're here to do a part, uh, a, a series for the students called Religion, R-E-A-L, Religion. And so you're welcome, as my understanding, to join us for any and all of that. Every one of these presentations, the unbelievable presentations, will build upon the previous presentation. So last night, Ty got us off to a great start, sort of an introduction then we're going to be going step by step through this uh, week of spiritual emphasis. You guys have a great uh, motto here, stronger and deeper and bolder and together. I don't remember all of it. I, I should remember. Sorry, Joel. Apologies for that. But we are thrilled to be here. It's going to be a great journey, and I want to invite you uh, to come not just to this morning. I know that many of you are here for church. This is what you do. Uh, but please, come to all of them. They are going to be amazing. And we will be, as Ty said last night, um, having that other kind of falling in love. There's the, the joy of, or that other kind of fun, excuse me, the joy of fun and all of that, but we'll be falling more and more in love with God and understanding, biblically speaking, His goodness. So it's going to be an awesome time, and I want to get uh, started with our presentation this morning, which is titled, Father Abraham and His Kids. In many ways, we will be continuing to set the table as Ty began last night, so let's have a quick prayer, and then we're going to be off to the races. Father in heaven, bless us now. As we open your word, may you open our hearts. Father, we are all here, different circumstances, different situations, but every one of us has a need, and you are perfectly aware of that need, of those needs. And so, Father, I pray that you would come down today by your Spirit, and that you would tailor-make this whole day, this whole Sabbath, and this presentation for the individual needs that are present here. Uh, be with us, Father. Be with me as we open the text of Scripture. May you open our hearts May we come away with a better understanding of who you are, a better understanding of the Word. And Father, please continue to bless us in our unbelievable series. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen, amen and amen and amen. All right. So I want to start by, by just sort of letting you know up front what we're going to be doing this morning. And I'm going to make a, a very big claim, a fairly, you would even say, audacious claim. And I understand the size of this claim, the audacity of this claim, but I want to just give it to you right up front here. The presentation that we're going to be doing this morning, you could summarize like this, and I'll give it to you here on a slide, and you might want to be taking pictures of some of these slides. Okay, it says this, God's covenant promise of what are those next words there? Land and, next word. Okay, let's say those together, if you would, with me. Land and descendants. Okay, we're going to be coming back to that theme over and again. God's covenant promise of land and descendants to Abraham 
is the hinge on which the whole narrative of Scripture swings. Now, again, that's a big claim. It's an audacious claim. But the idea here is that the entire narrative of Scripture, the sort of biblical theological edifice that is this whole book, I may, I'm going to maintain this morning, I'm going to build my case, I'm going to try to persuade you, that the hinge on which the whole story pivots is the story of God making and keeping a promise to a man named Abraham. And the essence of that promise can be boiled down to two ideas, land and descendants. What is it, everyone? Land and descendants. Okay, so let's start by sort of setting the table here with something that is very familiar to many of us, but the idea is so profound, so incredible, so unbelievable that we have to remind ourselves sometimes, especially those that are generational believers, generational Christians, we can, in our familiarity with the text, we can lose track of just how incredible some of these ideas are. And I want to share one with you today that's just absolutely astonishing. We're going to set it up here by by going, going to Genesis chapter 24. Now, we don't have time to go into background of all of these passages, but briefly, this is a man named Eliezer who's praying a prayer. He's been sent by Abraham. We'll come back to him in a moment. He's been sent by Abraham to go and find a, a wife for his son Isaac. And so he's going to pray a prayer, and I want to read that prayer here. Eliezer says, O, and you see there the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is a, a stand-in or a placeholder that alerts us, the translators have given that, that this is the proper name of God, right? The, the sort of uh, English equivalent is Y-H-W-H. Yahweh is what we'll say here. And I'll be often using that just so we can understand that it's not merely a title like Lord or, or Mr. or Sir. No, this is the proper name of God, like my name is David, for example. And so Eliezer here is praying, and he says, Oh, Yahweh, and this is crucial, God of my master, and then what's the next word? Abraham, please give me success this day. So when Eliezer begins to pray, he says, he says, Yahweh, God of Abraham. Now, a little bit later in the story of Genesis, Genesis chapter 26, this is now Yahweh appearing to him. The him here is Isaac. Okay, so again, it says, Then Yahweh appeared to Isaac the same night and said, I am the God of your father, what everyone? Abraham. Okay, very important. I'm the God of your father. Now, why the need to demarcate and to identify yourself? I mean, there's only one God. And this is one of the challenges that we face, especially people that are, again, generational believers, familiar with Scripture. One of the challenges is we need to remind ourselves to read Scripture forward because we are looking back on Scripture, retrospectively, historically, and we often assume quite mistakenly, that the things that we now know, the things that we now understand, the things that we now see, that the people that were going through these things understood what we now understand. And of course, they didn't. There's actually a fancy word for this kind of thinking. It's called anachronistic thinking. It basically means thinking out of order. And so when we're reading through Genesis or Exodus or any of the biblical narrative, one of the great tricks, one of the important sort of skills that we learn in understanding the Bible is to, insofar as it's possible, suspend our awareness of where the story is going and try to enter into the world and the experience of the people in real time. And so when we kind of go back here to the time of Eliezer, and in this case Isaac, we find again and again that God is identifying himself as the God of Abraham. The God of who, everyone? The God of... Well, why might that be? Well, the answer is because Abraham and his immediate descendants, Isaac and his Jacob, we'll see here in a moment... They did not possess what we now possess, Scripture in our hand, and a robust understanding, a sort of robust understanding of the great truth of monotheism that was bequeathed to the descendants of Abraham and has subsequently been passed on to us as followers of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, we understand there's one God. He's the creator God. He's the true God. But this is not the world of Abraham. It wasn't the world of Isaac or of Jacob. The world that they were in, the world of the ancient Near East, was a world in which there were many deities, many gods on offer, right? There was the God of that mountain and the God of that mountain, the God of that river, the God of that valley, the God of those people, the God of this clan. And this polytheistic world was a world in which it was important to understand that either geographically or in a familial sense, these gods were attached either to peoples or to places or to lands or to historical events. So you can imagine a very different world than the world that you are accustomed to or the world that you believe in, 
right? This sort of robust monotheism that we now understand because we have the whole canon of Scripture given to us. That's not the world of Eliezer, it's not the world of Abraham, and it's not the world of Isaac. And so God here is saying, I am the God of your master, Abraham. I'm the God of your father, Abraham. That's Genesis 26. Going forward a little further, Genesis 28, this is now God speaking to the grandson of Abraham. So we have Abraham, and then we have Isaac, and now this is Jacob. And it says in Genesis chapter 28, verse 13, And behold, Yahweh stood above it. It, in this case, is Jacob's ladder. And he said, I am Yahweh, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. That is to say, I'm the God of your dad and your granddad. Now, it continues, the land on which I will, uh, the land on which you are now lying, because he was lying down there and he had this incredible vision of Jacob's ladder, I will give to you and to your descendants. Notice that language again, land and descendants. So again and again, we find this language of God identifying himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We fast forward now a little bit to the book of Exodus, and we find right at the beginning of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, so God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with, say it with me if you would, with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Very good. Just a few verses later, Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Now this is what's really remarkable here, is that God then adds this. He says, this is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. What an astonishing condescension. God says, if you want to know who I am, who Yahweh is, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, his son, and I'm the God of Jacob, his grandson, and this is my name perpetually. What an astonishing revelation. What an astonishing condescension. And again, because of our familiarity with this, we, 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 we can, this can roll off the tongue so easily. So, so, yeah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we need to enter into the significance of this. That the infinite, eternal, illimitable God of the universe is here identifying himself. It's like saying, hey, uh, uh, you know, somebody introduces himself to me and they say, who are you? And I say, I'm Ron's neighbor. <laughs> oh, great. And Dennis as well. And Suzanne. Yes, I'm the neighbor of Ron, Dennis, and Suzanne. What an, what an unusual way to identify myself in reference to other people. And yet God here says, I, you want to know who I am? I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Egypt. So we could say it this way. In Scripture, God's voluntary, and when you read the text, not just Genesis and Exodus, but the whole sort of Old Testament canon, we get the sense that it's not merely voluntary, but it's even enthusiastic. God's enthusiastic identification with Abraham and his descendants is remarkable and revealing. It's analogous to saying you are the neighbor of someone, or you are the father of someone, or you are the brother of someone, to identify yourself with reference to who? Again, the infinite, eternal, illimitable God identifying himself with reference to Abraham, to his son Isaac, and to his grandson Jacob. It's remarkable. Now, why? Why would God say, this is not just my name for a time, this is not just my name, you know, a serviceable sort of placeholder. He says, this is my name for all the generations. I will be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, again, it goes back to a promise, a promise which I'm going to maintain here this morning as part of our unbelievable series, a promise on which the whole narrative of Scripture swings, this promise of land and descendants that God gives to Abraham and his descendants. Land and descendants. Say it with me one more time if you would. Land and descendants. Now, in order to understand the nature of the promise that God makes to Abraham, it will be helpful to spend at least a moment just reflecting on the structure of the book of Genesis. So the book of Genesis, of course, is the first book of Moses, the first book of the Bible, and it contains 50 chapters. How many chapters, everyone? 50 chapters. Now, the first 11 of those chapters are what we might call early biblical history or early anthropological history. And in the biggest and broadest of strokes, Moses paints the sort of early history of of the world, and even of the universe itself, right? Genesis chapters 1 to 11, unquestionably the most controversial, most debated, most disputed chapters in the whole of the biblical canon. 
Okay, now what's remarkable about this is that in these giant brush strokes covering just, you know, 11 chapters and several, you know, thousand words, God covers, as it were, the history of the early earth. And he does so in basically four events. God says in Genesis 1 and 2, there was creation. This is God speaking through Moses. In Genesis 3, 4, and 5, there was a fall. In Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9, there was a flood. In Genesis 10, the post-flood world. And then finally in Genesis 11, there was a tower. Now, just think that through. There was creation, there was a fall, there was a flood, there was a tower. Clearly, Moses is not setting out here to give us a detailed sort of modern historical way, the way that a modern history would be written. This is not what Moses is doing. I think we could fairly identify Genesis chapters 1 to 11 as a kind of prologue. Many of us have read books before where there's not just an introduction, but there's a prologue, and the, the word prologue literally comes from prologos, before the word. This is the, the introduction, the preamble, the, the prologue to the text. And Genesis chapters 1 to 11, what it effectively does is it sets the table for the story that follows. And what's remarkable is that even though you have these enormous brushstrokes, there was creation, there was a fall, there was a flood, there was a tower, when we get into the next 39 chapters of Genesis, it's as if, and not just as if, but Moses, in a literary sense and in a chronological sense, he slams his feet on the brakes and from Genesis chapter 12 to 50, which again is 39 chapters, we cover only some 300-ish years of history. So some approximately 2,000 years of history in 11 chapters, and then he slams as soon as we get to the story of Abraham. Now, just think about this here for a moment. Let's contrast it with, say, the United States of America. The United States of America is roughly or getting close to 250 years old, right? Founded the Declaration of Independence, 1776, July 4th. And if you were to take, just imagine this by way of contrast, if you were to take all of the books that have ever been written by popular writers, fiction writers, historical fiction writers, sc scholarly writers, and we were to take every book, every biography, every autobiography, every history that has ever been written on the history of the United States of America, we were to put it in a normal size, a 12 size font, it wouldn't fit in this auditorium. And yet... God in Moses describes the whole history of the early earth in Genesis 1 to 11 in just 11 chapters. And he says it basically was four events, creation, fall, flood, tower. And then he slams on the brakes and gets into the story of Abraham and his descendants. Again, Genesis 1 to 11 is effectively the prologue. It's the, it's the introduction so that we can understand the story. Well, what is the story? Well, when we get to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, this is the first time that we're kind of introduced to Abraham. Now, his name's not yet Abraham. It'll be changed. We're not going to dwell on that part of the story. He does appear very briefly in Genesis 11, but for the most part, this is the story that Moses is clearly racing to get to. Yes, there was creation, hugely important. I talked about that last night. Yes, there was a fall. Yes, there was a flood. Yes, there was a tower. But this is the story that as soon as Moses gets to Abraham, he just slows way down, and he goes into such, at times, excruciating detail that we are even told things like, uh, there were two brothers that had an argument over a bowl of soup. Okay, so feel the difference, right? Feel the difference. 2,000 years of history, there was creation, there was a flood, there was a fall, there was a, a tower, and then now it's like, yeah, so let's talk about the nature of the soup here. No, we are very much in the weeds here, and it's helpful to understand the sort of structure of Genesis to see that the, mo the story that Moses at least believes he's telling is the story of Abraham and God making a promise to him and to his descendants. Let's read that here, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. This is the passage that the uh, two young people did the wonderful job of reading. Now, Yahweh had said to Abram, yet his, again, his name has not yet been changed, get out from your country, from your family, from your father's house to a, what's the word? Amen. To a land. Now, notice that the whole sort of biblical narrative here, the beginning of the Abrahamic narrative begins with two words. What are those two words? Get out. That Exodus motif will continue through the remainder of Scripture, all the way through, obviously there's a book by that name, Exodus, but all the way through to the book of Revelation. This motif of get out, come out, is a, is a saturative biblical narrative that we will return to. 
When God invites Abram here to relocate, this is nothing like a move from California to Idaho or Texas to Oklahoma or any other kind of analogy that we might have in the modern world. No, 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 no. When he is inviting Abram to leave the land of Mesopotamia, the, the, the word literally means the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, he is inviting him to leave everything that is known to him, everything that is familiar to him. We live again, this is our anachronistic thinking, in a world in which we can just get on an airplane and we can be in France, we can be in Indonesia, we can be wherever we want to be in a matter of a day or two. But this is not the world of Abraham, of course. In the ancient world, people lived most of their lives. They, they married and they reproduced and they died within a, say, 25-mile radius of the place they were born. This is, a, this is an amazing invitation that God is extending to Abraham. And it's Abram, and it's not just an invitation to leave geographically. This is very important. It's an invitation to leave a place that was occupied by other deities, other gods. This is a departure from what is known. This is a departure from another culture. This is coming out of all that was familiar to him. Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. God continues, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Now, when we get to verse 3, God says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And I purposely just left off the last little bit here of Genesis 12, 3, because if that's all we had, we might fairly and reasonably read God's promise to Abram as a kind of favoritism. Now, we wouldn't yet know what that favoritism is. Is it a genetic favoritism? Is it a cultural favoritism? Is it, a, is it some kind of a geographical? We don't know. But the last clause of the great Abrahamic promise alerts us to the fact that favoritism is not on offer here. Something else is going on. And in you, all, read this with me if you would, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So now we are aware of why the blessing, why the promise. Because God is going to do something in and through Abraham and his descendants that is going to be absolutely remarkable. The language that I've used in the past is that Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The world of Genesis 1 to 11, and I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but that broad stroke world of creation, fall, flood, and tower, the story that's being told there, the prologue that's being told there by Moses is a world that is divided, that is broken, that is utterly fragmented. And it's fragmented along two axes, what we might call the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. That is to say, the problem of Genesis 3, which is isolation from and alienation from God, Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the problem of Genesis 11, which is the Tower of Babel, which is now a fragmentation along the horizontal axis, where people are dispersed linguistically and geographically and then eventually culturally. So when we come out of that world of Genesis 1 to 11, we're in a broken world, not at all a world that God had intended. A world where people are alienated from God, alienated and isolated from one another geographically, linguistically, culturally, etc. It's a broken world that does not bear but a passing resemblance to the world that God had designed and intended in Genesis 1 and 2. And effectively, this is what God is saying in Genesis 12. I'm going to put the world back together again through this promise that I'm making to you and to your descendants. God will put Humpty Dumpty back together again, but in a remarkable and unexpected way. According to the text, why was God promising to bless Abram and his descendants? We don't have to wonder about this. We, we don't have to conjecture about this. The text tells us, God says, in you, how many of the families? All, All the families of the earth will be blessed. So let's just, let's just make what will seem like a really audacious summary of this, but is completely biblically sound. God's promise to Abraham and his descendants was not regional and exclusive. It was, what's that next word? Global. It was global and what? Ah, now it doesn't look like favoritism, whether cultural or genealogical. No, no, this can't be favoritism because, yes, God is going to bless Abram. Yes, he's going to bless his descendants. But the purpose of the Abrahamic covenant blessing will be that the whole world can somebody say amen? The whole world will somehow be blessed through this promise that Yahweh has made. Now we can begin to understand God's identification. 
I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, and I'm the God of Jacob. Now, I brought up with me here today my new preaching Bible. I just got it, oh, probably a year and a half ago now. And it's a, it's a Bible. It doesn't have a lot of study notes in it. It's just an ordinary preaching Bible. I want you to go, if you have one of these old-fashioned paper Bibles, I know many of you are just looking at your phones, but I want to show you something. Find the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. And I want to show you that in your Bible, there is a single uninspired page. You might not know this, but your Bible actually has a page in it that does not belong there, remarkably. Uh, if you begin in Genesis chapter 1 and go all the way through to the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, there's a single page, and only one page, that should not be in your Bible. Now, when you get to Matthew chapter 1, you will find a page just before it that says, the New Testament. Some of you, does your Bible have it? So you're looking at it right there. Notice my Bible does not have it. My Bible goes from Malachi 4 to Matthew 1 because I tore it out. <laughs> I tear it out or I fold it in all of my Bibles because the, the page doesn't belong there. And this isn't just a cute, you know, sort of a homiletical illustration. What that does, that, that, that uninspired page, the New Testament, actually introduces a discontinuity to the mind. It says that that's the Old Testament, right? And this is the now what? This is the shiny New Testament. That's the Old Testament. That's the antiquated Testament. That's the dusty Testament. That's the, that's the obsolete Testament. But now we have a what? Now we have a New Testament. So I would invite you to, in, if you're feeling a little more cavalier like I do, just tear that page out. Or at, at a minimum, fold it over, and I'll, I'll show you why. Because I want you to take a look at the very first verse, the very first chapter of the New Testament, the so-called New Testament, as distinct from the so-called Old Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy, that is to say the family tree, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of, what's his name, everyone? Abraham. Abraham. So let me just translate that for you. What Matthew is saying in the opening of his gospel, in the opening of the New Testament is that in order to really understand what's going on with Jesus the Messiah and with his story, you have to understand the background of people like David and people like Abraham. Now, Matthew then goes on to say, after going through all of the begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, he gets to verse 17, and verse 17 is so pedagogically and theologically helpful because what Matthew does in chapter 1, verse 17, is he gives us an inspired way to understand, view, and interpret the Old Testament. This isn't David Ashrick's understanding. It's not Ty Gibson's understanding. This is Matthew's inspired way to understand the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. There were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile in Babylon, and 14 from the exile in Babylon to the Messiah. Now, any Jewish reader would immediately detect that if we have 14, 14, and 14, what we have is 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, which anticipates the seventh seven, which of course then anticipates, is pregnant with meaning because it anticipates something called the Jubilee. Now, we don't have time here to dwell on the 50th year that was the Jubilee, the, the culmination of the seven sevens, but any Jewish reader would immediately detect stylistically and historically what's going on here. 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the captivity, and 14 generations from the captivity to the Messiah. Each one of these Old Testament eras or chapters is distinct, but what I want you to really notice here for our purposes is that where does the story begin? The story begins with Abraham. Now, we know that Adam precedes Abraham. We know that Noah precedes Abraham, but here again, as with Moses, Matthew understands that there is something utterly significant, utterly profound, utterly pregnant about the story of Abraham. That is, again, the hinge on which the whole biblical narrative swings. These three discrete chapters could be, we could go into detail why these chapters. Why Abraham to David? Why is that an important chapter? Why David to the captivity? Why is that an important chapter? And, of course, then the captivity to Messiah. Now, we will come back to this in a future presentation. But we can say, very interestingly, that Abraham came out, as I already mentioned, of the land of Mesopotamia. Well, when Israel, the descendants of Abraham, went back into Babylon, they went back to Mesopotamia. 
the land between the two rivers. And so we can see in the exile and then in the subsequent exodus under Messiah a kind of restart to the whole biblical narrative. The entire biblical narrative starts out where here you have the promise of land and descendants to the realization of land and descendants with a a unified monarchy under a godly King David. And here we have again back into captivity, back into Babylon, and yet God promises that there will be an even greater king, Messiah, Jesus, King of kings, and Lord of lords. Now all of that is to say that you can't really, or maybe a better word there would be fully, You can't fully understand the story of Jesus without first knowing the story of, say it with me, Abraham and his family. Now, one of my very favorite stories to this effect, and many stories could be marshaled to this effect, but one of my favorites is found in the Gospel of Matthew. I'm just going to start reading in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. It's probably one of my top three, top five favorite interactions that Jesus ever had. I love this story. I go back to it over and over again. I've preached on it dozens of times over the years. I just want you to hear this story. Matthew chapter 8, I'll begin reading in verse 5. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said, shall I come and heal him? Verse 8, the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed, for I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell this one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus hears this, he is perfectly incredulous. He is astonished. He is surprised. He marvels in the New King James. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and he said to those who followed, because at this point, even fairly early in the ministry of Jesus, he was having reasonably large crowds that were interested in what he had to say, his teachings, proverbs, and healings. He turned to those that followed and he said, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now, this would have been absolutely scandalous. It would have been embarrassing. It would have been utterly piercing to those that were following Jesus. I mean, what a thing to say. What an, what an, un, what an unscripted, impossible thing to say. And one of the reasons that we can be totally confident that Jesus the Messiah, that Jesus is the Messiah, is that he said things that no one could have or would have invented in the first, second, or third centuries A.D. Now, no one, nobody inventing a Messiah would put this in the mouth of the Messiah. The unambiguous, unqualified, enthusiastic affirmation of a Gentile who's a Roman, who's a soldier, who's a leader of soldiers. And yet Jesus has the temerity, the audacity to say that he's not found faith of this quality. He's not found faith like this in the whole of Israel. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus then twists the knife. He says, and I say to you, many will come. What will come, everyone? Many Many will come from the east and the west, which is just a first century Jewish way of saying, not from here. Many will come from over there, not just this little strip of real estate, not just the, the narrow strip of land that was ruled by David under a united monarchy. No, 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 no. Many will come from the east and the west. Now watch this to further twist the knife and to make the point, they will sit down in the kingdom, say it with me if you would, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What? Now, the the remarkable thing here is that if you read the subtext, the people are scandalized at Jesus saying this. But if they had been familiar, as they could have and should have been, with the Abrahamic promise, they would have been not at all surprised. Because the Abrahamic promise had always been that I will bless you and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All Jesus is saying here is a continuation and an unpacking of what had been said by God to uh, Abraham millennia before. Following the dispersion of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, that vertical and horizontal fragmentation that we talked about. God promised to bring the world back together through his promise to Abraham, Genesis 12. This he has done, is doing, in Jesus the Messiah, himself a descendant of Abraham, which is the very point that Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 makes. The Apostle Paul, and we'll get into this in one of my future presentations, says it like this. 
Scripture foresaw, or we might use a synonym there, Scripture anticipated, saw in advance, that God would justify the who? The who? That is to say the non-Jewish people. Those that are not genealogical, lineal descendants of Abraham, by faith, he preached the good news or he announced the good news in advance to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed to you. Now, there's so much going on here. But the fact that Paul would take Genesis chapter 12, 3 and say, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel is that God is going to put the world back together. Can somebody say amen? Amen. God's going to fix the world. He's going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Something that all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't do, God will do. And Paul says that God preached the gospel in advance. Friends, Jesus is, of course, the hero of the story. Can somebody say amen? amen? But too many of us don't know why Jesus is the hero of the story. And we will have time in our unbelievable series to unpack why it is, how it is that Jesus is the hero of the story. Like like cheaters on a test or cheaters on a quiz, many of us can give the right answers without really understanding the profundity of why the answers are so incredible. To briefly summarize, Jesus, as a descendant of Abraham, is himself the means by which God kept the early gospel promise of a fruitful land and of numberless descendants to fill it. This is the promise that was given right there in Genesis. It's a continuation of how God began the whole thing. God blessed them and said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And what are those three words? Fill the earth. Fast forwarding to the time of Noah, the very same command is given. So God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Very good. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it, God said to Noah. And then we've already seen one of the great promises that God made to Abraham. Here's another one. Yahweh said to Abram, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are. Look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. For the, what's our word? The land which you see I give to you and your descendants. I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could be numbered. Here we have the embryonic, Abrahamic promise that God is going to fix the world. God's, as we said, this is how we began and this is how we close, God's covenant promise of land and descendants to Abraham is the hinge on which the whole narrative of Scripture swings. From the beginning, God's desire has remained unchanged to have a flourishing people joyfully and loyally inhabiting a fruitful and safe land. We could summarize that like this. A godly people in a goodly land. This is the story of Genesis. This is the story of creation. This is the story of Noah. This is the story of Abraham. And this, as we will see, is the story of Jesus. A godly people inhabiting a goodly land. Can somebody say amen? Amen. This is the story of Scripture upon which we will build moving forward. The the point here is that the whole narrative of Scripture swings on this hinge, that God has made and kept a promise to a man named Abraham and to his descendants. And what is the nature of that promise? A godly people inhabiting a goodly land. Brothers and sisters, I want to be one of those people that inhabits that goodly land. How about you? We're going to learn more and more about it. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, today we believe And we receive the promise, this great promise, the promise that you will put a broken world back together again. And Father, it's not just a world that is historically broken. It's not just a world that is externally or politically broken. Father, this is a world that sometimes is broken internally. We have needs, we have hurts, we have addictions and temptations. Father, we not only need some external fixing and restoration and healing. Father, we need to be healed. We need to be fixed. We need to be saved. So God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, come and fix us in Christ, just as you have promised to fix the wide world. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen and amen.